The two readings for the lecture videos for this week were from 2011 and 1977. The 2011 article looks at how Luca Pacioli describes the method to adopt when recording inventory or goods or wares. And the way that Pacioli described it is labelled by Stoner in that article as early perpetual inventory records, EPIR. And what he did was he looked at several bookkeeping manuals published in Britain up to the end of the 18th century. He examined them to see if that approach adopted by Pacioli or recommended by Pacioli could be found in those books. And he did so because he did not think or did not believe that that method was very useful. And I did Basil Yami, as he said, because it doesn't actually help you to calculate your overall profit. So for example, under that method, if you buy five chairs for 10 pounds each, you debit the chair account for 50 pounds. You sell four of them 20 pounds each, you credit the chair account with 80 pounds. If you then balance the account, take the 50 away from the 80, it leaves you 30. You've got 30 pounds more revenue than you spent. But that isn't the profit because there's still one share in inventory that costs 10 pounds. So that approach to recording inventory doesn't make it easy to calculate your overall profit. You have to make adjustments for the amount of inventory left. You need to decide what to value to place on it. It can be very messy. So he, he didn't understand why that would be used. And he, he looked at all these others and he concluded that actually the approach didn't change very much. And it only really started to change as you got towards the Industrial Revolution, which he dates as between 1760 and 1830. That could be 1840, it could be um, before 1760, but this is the period he's chosen, which is reasonably typical of the, the, the dates that are placed on the Industrial Revolution. But that Industrial Revolution is only in Britain. Remember from Arnold that the labels we put on periods or dates in history are very specific to countries or regions or places. And this is a British one, the Industrial Revolution. And he says that in that period, it's been reported that there's a shift towards using perpetual inventory valuation, PIV, which is a much more suitable approach if you're going to calculate your overall profit. So you could see that these books reflected this, uh, this shift, but, or that the shift was taking place. And that after the end of the 18th century, there was a shift generally to away from the early perpetual inventory record approach or system. And he looked for, or reflected on, critically reflected on what he was looking at. And he came up with some speculative explanations. He had two. That there was a switch towards the teaching of the perpetual inventory valuation approach because the, the nature of accounting and financial reporting changed. Or, or maybe as well as, the nature of the teaching of accounting changed. Now that might have changed, the teaching might have changed just because the teachers decided to try a different way of doing it. In other words, what he's saying is these manuals that he had trusted to reflect reality, when in fact textbooks don't reflect reality, they simplify it, that these textbooks may not actually reflect the reality of the workplace so much as just the, the wishes of the teachers. It's a reasonable point, however, if you look at the, the textbooks used in first year undergraduate accounting courses, 
they typically include double entry bookkeeping and, and the basics of making entries. And they are there because it is believed that that is the necessary knowledge for any graduate of those subjects, going minimum knowledge going into the professional world of the accountant. And in fact, in the UK, all the accounting degrees are what we call accredited by the professional accountancy bodies. And that means that they, the professional accountancy bodies, believe that the content of the degree program constitutes the basic minimum requirement in terms of knowledge for anyone going into the accounting profession and training to become an accountant. So they're basically saying textbooks um, reflect what happens in practice, but it is simplified. So he was saying that in, uh, at the point when the perpetual inventory evaluation method started to replace the uh, early perpetual inventory records system in the textbooks, might have been due to teachers just deciding to try it a different way. But at the back and underlying all this was an assumption that what they were teaching had at least some bearing on what was happening in the workplace. And what he, came, what he also speculated on was that the nature of accounting and financial reporting had changed. And by that he was saying, that, well, maybe the industrial revolution caused businesses and their owners to be more interested in overall profit than they had been before because they don't get that from the uh, early perpetual inventory record system. It's much more difficult to get to overall profit from that. Or it's more difficult. So maybe that was what was happening. Maybe people were starting to do financial reporting who previously hadn't. That was his conclusion. He also in the article mentioned that Pacioli said that every time you record the purchase or sale of goods in the journal and the ledger, you must include full descriptions, quantities and values. And he said, well, that's what is recommended, but it's not something that you necessarily see all the time. And he's right, it wasn't necessarily commonplace to include the quantities, descriptions, yeah, and the values, yes, but not the quantities. Because the quantities aren't needed for the, the financials. You don't balance an account based on the quantities, you balance it based on the financial information that's been recorded in the money columns. Um, but having said that, in the 14th century in Tuscany, Florence and Tuscany, there are many examples of ledger accounts where the quantities are recorded but they are recorded in the margin outside to the left of the actual account. So if you imagine that the account uh, begins two centimetres in from the left of the page with the writing on it, well, to the left of that, maybe one, in, one centimetre in from the left, you'll have the quantity. And that makes it very easy for the merchant to see how much of that good he has available for sale, and it also tells him when he's got none left. So it was a useful managerial tool to put the quantity in. And it's also needed in order to actually find out where your profit is on, on an individual account prepared under early perpetual inventory records. So there's a good reason for having it. So anyway, that was his conclusion. It was either because companies start to finance, do financial reporting or because the teachers decide to try something different. And it doesn't look likely that it was the teachers. Then we move on to Frederick Lane. Now, Frederick Lane was spent decades, over 30 years, working in the Venetian state archives and other archives in Venice, looking at account books because they are the primary source for economic historians. And he was an economic historian. And Frederick Lane starts off by talking about capitalism. And he says, well, you know, you've got the 
the change in business that came about in the 11th, 12th centuries, and then the, you've got the commercial revolution of the 13th, 14th. And really, you have a spirit of capitalism that's emerging with accounting as one of the tools of management adopted in pursuit of this capitalist ethos, profit-making ethos. And that the way that accounting was used changed the dynamics of, the, of business organizations, their structure. And he was referring there to a shift that did take place where uh, in Northern Italy, where previously the merchants had gone, traveled around and done the business away from home. Now, the main players, the big merchants, they stayed at home and they conducted business internationally using agents and branches. That was a big shift. And what Lane was saying is that accounting enabled that to happen, that bookkeeping, he's talking about bookkeeping, enabled that to happen. So the way they use bookkeeping changed the way business was done. You could argue it's actually the other way around, that the shift in the way business is done required that the bookkeeping change. He, he quotes uh, Raymond de Ruber as, as saying, what's that effect? And then, and this is a crucial point, he starts talking about what that entailed. And he starts talking about venture accounts, venture accounting. And venture accounting showed the profit or loss on each investment or venture separately. So when you'd sold everything of one venture, it was all sold, the balance on the account was a profit. So going back to that example of the chairs, you bought five chairs for 10 pounds each, you sold four for 20 pounds each. So currently you've got a 50 pound debit and 80 pound credit. Then you sell the fifth chair for 30 pounds. So you've got, still got 50 as a debit, and you've now got 110 as a credit. And that tells you that you've sold them all and you've got a 60 pound profit because that's the balance on the account. And that's what the venture accounting did. Now that is a system that Craig Stoner called the early perpetual inventory records system. But the economic historians already have had a name for it. Venture accounting. And what venture accounting did was it recorded the commercial investments through merchandise accounts, which were debited for wares, that's goods, purchased or received from agents overseas. So that's what you did. You just did commercial investments. That's what you put into the goods you buy in, that you're buying to sell. Um, or that someone sent you, what you paid for them and all the rest of it. And according to uh, the article by Lane, not only did they do that with the, the goods and the wares they were selling, but they did a similar thing with their financial ventures and bills of exchange, for which they used exchange accounts. So you've got the commercial ventures, you've got the financial ventures. And then you've got the third main type that the Venetians were involved in, and that was the viaggio or voyage account. Viaggio's Italian for voyage. And he describes that process for the voyages by saying, you know, in the, the venturing, venture accounting credit is the appropriate merchandise account for the goods taken to a specified place and debited a Viaggio account. So you've got your, let's say you've got your goods in your warehouse. And let's say this time it's tables. And you're going to send them from uh, Venice to Champagne, France. And you're going to send them on a ship. What you do is you look at your, your um, table account. And let's say you've, got, you've, you've bought tables for £20 each. And uh, you wouldn't have anything else. Let's say you've got 100 tables in that account. So it's got a debit of 100 times 20, which is 2,000. And you're going to send 60 of them on a void. 
See, credit the account for 60 times 20 is 1,200. And you debit the voyage account with the same amount of 1,200. And then the voyage takes place, you sell them all on the trip, you credit the account every time, the voyage account, and at the end when you sold them all, the profit you make on the voyage is a balance on the voyage account. So that's the voyage accounting. What Lane said was that a grouping of transactions under venture accounting and the ability to check the records that are in them made it easier for the resident merchant to keep track of what his partners, agents were doing, but he couldn't see them. So whoever went on the voyage, whatever his agent was that he'd sent something to to be sold, he could look and he could check. And even with the, the venture accounts, initial venture account, let's say the, the, the merchant had a manager in place running a business for him, he could check the entries in the venture account against the information he had. Now just focusing, because it's the most, comp it's the most extensive one and it's the best one for getting the, the understanding of what was going on. We had a venture account. The agent responsible for that venture uh, would be keeping accounts in double entry and would send to the resident merchant, the principal, a balanced account with precise figures for, for specific or specified items of expense and receipts. When the principal received that, he could compare it against reports from other agents, which might contain information that was relevant such as maybe as two agents in one city, two agents in Constantinople, and one of them sent back a report saying that currently the, the city tax on imports is 5%. The other one in his report says the city tax rate is 3%. So you can compare that. Also, there was a huge network, a vast network of letters being sent all over Northern Europe the commercial world as a whole in the 15th century. So the resident merchant could compare what has been reported by the agent in Constantinople with what the letters he's received from all sorts of people in Constantinople might be saying. And he can also um, look at what it says in the merchant manuals that were widely distributed at that time which contained things like freight charges and, and taxes of all sorts all over the place. There's huge lists. You can look at them and see if the agent's report seems to be using figures that weren't what the manuals say, and then you can investigate it. You write someone and say, can you confirm what the current rate is for this? And you get the letter back in, in a week or two, and then it tells you whether the agent is, is trying to Either, well, the agent's either inefficient or the agent is stealing from you. So that's a big step forward. So by, by using venture accounting, the resident merchant was able to control what was going on, the activities of his agents, his partners, and his managers, all of whom he could not see, could not see what they were doing. And what Lane thought was that an accounting system, of which this is an example, makes a contribution to business if it focuses attention on what needs to be checked. And the checking is done from other sources. So the accounting system is where you gather the information and then you use other sources to verify it. And if the accounting system is designed in such a way to facilitate that, that is very useful to business. Effectively, he's saying that's why people use double entry bookkeeping at that period. In fact, he does go stronger than that. He had his adamant that they did. So, during the process of the checking, you find errors, inconsistencies, omissions, and falsifications. You find them all. However, at that point, he highlights um, a problem that is in the literature the accounting history, literature, and in the accounting literature, because he refers to textbooks as well. And that is the, 
the definition of double entry. And he said in 19, said in 1977 in this article, well, there is no one definition for double entry. It seems to vary depending on who, who you, you read. Or, you know, you can have a large number of different definitions. And he, he, to some extent, he, he puts people together and says, well, that's very similar to that. That's very similar to that. And he concludes, if you really want to, to understand what you're looking at, and to know when to recognize the existence of double entry, why don't you just look at duality? And duality is just that, that two entries are made for every transaction, one is a debit, one's a credit, and they're equal. That's duality. And he said, well, basically, if you're not sure what double entry is and it appears that there is no real guidance because people can't make up their minds, let's just go for the common lowest common denominator of duality, and that's what we should use. And that's effectively what he was forced to do because the accounting historians couldn't make up their mind and, and the accounting textbook writers they couldn't, they were just very inconsistent or different variations on a theme. So it was no help to anyone. So he did narrow down. So according to Lane, the surviving 15th century Venetian books record the profits and losses on the various investments without any concern of assigning profits and losses to specified periods of time. And there's a concept in accounting that's, that's why everyone nowadays would recognize it, periodicity, which is that accounts are prepared for a period. And for example, PLCs listed on the London Stock Exchange must prepare an annual report with their annual financial statements annually, every year on the same date. And that's what today's companies do. But in the 15th century Venice, all they were interested in was the profits and losses on the various investments made. That's the ventures made, whether they be commercial, financial, or the special form of commercial, which is the, the voyage account. And he says that it's impossible that the Viaggio accounts, the voyage accounts, were devised expressly as a tool of management in handling agents. There's a theory that's used in economics and in accounting called agency theory. And that basically says, if you're the principal and you have an agent, so if you're the resident merchant and you've got in Venice, you've got an agent in Constantinople. You've immediately got a problem because you can't see what's going on. So you put incentives into place in the contract between you and the agent that will give the agent reasons for doing what you want. And you keep an eye on the agent by gathering information that will confirm or deny what the agent is telling you. But you'll never get rid of it all. However, by putting in those control mechanisms, you can reduce the problem. And the, Lane is saying the Azure accounts quite possibly were invented as a tool of management handling agents. And that makes a great deal of sense. It goes on, they could have been used to guide future investments. And this is where someone who really understands commerce scores a big plus. He says that these are not investments with regard to the places that you do business or the commodities you trade in. These are investments concerning the choice of the agent that you use. That's what the Viagio's accounts gave the resident merchant most of all. His ability to tell whether the agents that he was using were doing a good job. And if they weren't, if his analysis showed they weren't, he would just push the agent to one side and use someone else. They were also useful, Viagio accounts, because if you had a legal dispute between the agent and the resident merchant, 
in the age and then principally the legal dispute. The accounting records, the bookkeeping records and the Viaggio accounts, which had been prepared in the, the proper way as they had to be, were in a sense, were in fact were taken as uh, legal evidence. They were taken as evidence of the word of the merchant and that was covered earlier in the course. So if you had a, a, a Viaggio account, it was a very useful starting point in the event of a dispute. And this was particularly relevant if someone, if one of the parties died. The account book was the record of that person and would be treated legally as that person's, what that person would see under oath, which made it far more secure to trade a distance than had it not been the case. And that really was a problem. There's, there's plenty of examples of a partner's agents of that period dying during the time when they were acting for someone. But just looking at that, the, the existence of, of the Viaggio accounts, the Voyage accounts, meant that you could actually assess the quality of your agents. It was very, very important. It also meant that you, you knew what your profit or loss was on the voyage, which is handy. Um, you could you could compare your details that you retained of what was going on with what the agent said and compare it against what other agents are telling you and what you're hearing in correspondence and what you get in the merchant manuals. All very useful. But mainly it ensures that your business is, is on the sound footing because you're using the right people. So that's why Lane suggests that it's possible that the Viaggio accounts were invented because of the need to control agents. And it makes an awful lot of sense. Now you compare that to what Craig Stoner wrote, where in his opinion, the early perpetual inventory record system was of no use for anything meaningful. But that it switched to the perpetual inventory valuation method during the period of the Industrial Revolution. And he thought that was possibly because of, of the changing practices as regards to financial reporting. That's quite possibly correct. But what Lane tells you is why the early perpetual inventory record system was useful. So Stoner was, was wrong on that count, as were the sources that he used, Wooden Zangster, Yami, who had said, well, there's not much point in doing that. Or at least there was an explanation that could have been found from the economic history literature. But at that point, that period, well, accounting historians were using that literature, they weren't using it, a great deal of it. And in fact, the sources that are in the, the in Craig Stoner article are, are entirely correct, appropriate, and you really can't fault them. And what he was using was what was the common database of things that accounting historians used. But the economic historians knew a lot better. And uh, the article by Frederick Lane has a past to it, as it refers to at the beginning. Um, in 1975, Basil Yami had published an article in which he was very critical of a book that Frederick Lane had published on, which included some material on how bookkeeping was done in Venice in the 15th century. And he basically said, that's just nonsense. So the 1977 article, his response, and goes through the points I've raised here and gives examples where he actually takes the ledgers, the account books of merchants that were in, active. And he demonstrates through what's in those records, how the merchant could use the information that was available. And plus, in that period, agents and principals swapped roles quite often. So it, if I'm a resident merchant in Venice, I'll be, I'm obviously a principal. I had an agent in Constantinople, okay, that person does work for me, but that person in Constantinople 
might use me as an agent in Venice. So we've got sort of parallel working relationships between the parties. And then you add in another agent who's also a principal, and maybe that third agent who the one in Constantinople, you, Constantinople uses is in Damascus. Or maybe the agent in Damascus of the merchant in Constantinople sends me things in Venice, so I am his agent. So there's a lot of uh, interaction between the pe people involved. And when you have that situation where everyone knows everyone else, it's extremely easy to find out what's going on. The venture accounting system adopted in Northern Italy, in Venice, dealt with the issues as best it could. And in Lane's opinion, it was a very effective, very effective device. It was a similar system adopted in uh, Tuscany. It was slightly different because they didn't have the same reliance on the voyages, but the overall principle was the same. So the use of venture accounting, you control your, the people you can't see, your partners, your agents, and your managers. And it was a big step forward for business because it allowed the merchants to focus on running the whole business in various places all at the same time, where previously that was just not possible because the accounting systems couldn't cope. And that's really why double entry became dominant because it gives you that ability to control it and no other approach, no other bookkeeping approach does.